So welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. For many of us, running a single mile sounds tough. I know it used to be for me. Never mind running an entire marathon. Well, my guest today has not only done that, but a whole lot more. In fact, he's run the equivalent of 172 marathons in a row. In just a minute, uh, I'll be speaking with the ultra marathon runner, author, and motivational speaker, Charlie Engel. Charlie has run 4,500 miles through the Sahara Desert and survived 16 months in federal prison. That's an interesting combination that we're going to get into, but it considers his more than two decades of sobriety as one of his biggest feats to date. Wow, what a history. This is going to be good, folks. He released his memoir, Running Man, three years ago, and has touched countless lives with his story of courage, perseverance, and redemption. Today we'll discuss his strategies and setbacks with addiction and incarceration, and how running helped him overcome adversity and forge ahead. We'll also chat about his incredible record-breaking treks around the globe and how physical exercise can help you work through your own struggles. Charlie, thanks for joining me today. Truly my pleasure. I, I love, that was the best intro I've ever had, I believe. So wow, thank you I for mean, that. I mean, this is impressive, impressively crazy and mm -hmm. motivational. So, you know, you look like the picture of health, uh, but you spent a decade of your life addicted to drugs and alcohol? Indeed. Yeah, it was my, my 20s primarily were, were pretty much a disaster, but um, it, addiction doesn't look like what people assume it does always, you know? So I was, I was this really bad uh, alcoholic and cocaine addict, yet I was also the top salesman at my company, or you know, my, my idea was that if I balanced uh, the really bad things I was doing with some amazing good things that it would all work out. And uh, I always thought that the, uh, you know, the boss wouldn't fire the top salesman and, and that absolutely turned out not to be true, so. Ah. <laughs> so it, it, uh. is that most, most addicts, and I care for a lot of addicts and former addicts, mm -hmm. um, have to hit rock bottom. Sure. Uh, is that what happened to you? It is. You know, I, I actually, the birth of my first son was a real catalyst for me. I was 29. I'd tried everything to quit. You know, I, I had been successful in short bursts, but never could maintain like so many addicts. And I, and I was like, okay, my son is going to change all that just by his mere presence. And not surprisingly, what I found with this tiny, beautiful baby boy was, was love and hope and strength that I'd really never had before. But two months after his birth, you know, there I am again on another six day binge and the police are going through my car and you know, there's bullet holes in the car that were you know, put there by somebody who was trying to shoot me. And, even after six days of no sleep and all the things I was doing, I had the clearest thought ever. And that thought was simple, that nobody is coming to save me. You know, my son can't save me. And I had always looked for these external reasons uh, to quit. And it took, in that moment, uh, the realization that I had to do this for myself and that there was no other way. And you know, I went to a 12-step meeting that night and I got up and put my running shoes on the next day. And I ran and went to a meeting every day for the next three years without missing a single day. And through that mechanism began to create a life for myself. So um, there's a lot of teaching that uh, you will always be an addict, mm. but you have to be addicted to something <laughs> Indeed. Right? Indeed. So were you a runner before that? Or did you say, holy cow, I'm going to go? No, I was. And I, I had a legacy of running. I'd run in high school. Mm. And, and even in my, like I was a binger, you know, again, with addicts, not everybody is like an everyday, all the time user. I would have a couple of terrible months and then I would get sick of it and I would clean up and, you know, for a month or a couple months or whatever. And, I, and running was always a mechanism for me to both get myself physically fit, 
Um, but I, I also recognize there's a combination of um, self-imposed suffering, almost penance, uh, self-flagellation that actually goes along with that. Because of course, as any self-respecting addict, I felt badly about myself. And I felt like I wasn't worthy of love or forgiveness or you know, many of the things that I saw in other people. And strangely, running began as a way to sort of purge that, that what felt like craziness all the time. And I had the side benefit of, uh, I just knew I felt great when I ran. Al although I will say, <laughs> people assume I love running, and I, and I do love to run, but they make the mistake of understanding that for me, running is a vehicle towards not only, um, you know, culture, cultural exploration, but also uh, it's the stopping that feels great. It's the endorphin release that comes <laughs> at the end that actually feeds a lot of what, you know, what I need and what I, what I feel. So the act of running, sure, I, I like it in a lot of ways, but I like where it takes me more than that. You know, there's a, there's a saying in running that the, the hardest step in running is the step out the door. Totally. Is that? 100%. Not really for me because it's embedded, but when I coach people, I tell them all the time, you know, you have to trust me. Like, you haven't run since you were, you know, 12 years old. And, and think of the, the joy that you had when you were young. You know, we all did what was natural as a kid, as a pre-adolescent, as an adolescent. You know, you, you got home from school and the first thing you did was run out the door to your friend's house to play or whatever. Like, we, we naturally ran everywhere we went because emotionally that's what we wanted to do and physically it was the fastest way to get there. Right. And when we get older, of course, we stop doing that because when you haven't run in 20 years, it hurts. It feels lousy. People get motivated and they go train seven days a week and it, and it hurts them because they don't understand the way to you know, slowly work themselves into it and find something you know, that works for them as an individual. Yeah, when, I, when my wife finally convinced me to start running uh, in my mid-40s, um, I had such awful shin splints yeah. and I'm going, yeah. this is not fun, yeah. you know, yeah. why, why would I do this? But then uh, we got a dog, a very active dog. And uh, actually, I learned to run, you know, from watching Thanks my dog. Thanks to the dog. <laughs> yeah, dog man, yeah. this is great. Yeah. You know, let's do this. Yeah. And I'm going, oh, you stupid dog. Well, it's, it's interesting, right, that even with someone like you, with your, your vast knowledge of physiology, you know, shin splints are the, you know, it's just a way of saying tendonitis. I mean, it's really all it is. And yeah. it's an overuse injury, which means that you've done too much too soon. Right you know, or maybe your shoes are off or whatever, but you know, it, it, it just takes time like anything else. So did, did bullet holes in your car <laughs> help to hit rock bottom or? In, <laughs> indeed, yeah, well, and, and it, was, it was the, I know you work with addicts. I mean, a, addicts aren't, it's not that we're not smart enough, you know, if, if no, let's if, actually let's dispel that myth right now. Huh. Addicts are some of actually the most intelligent, smartest people there are huh. on this planet. They really are. We're great salesmen too. Ex we can sell anybody anything. Like we're okay. No, right? that, that's absolutely <laughs> true. That's absolutely true. Yeah. But I mean, you have to be actually highly intelligent to harm yourself as as hard as voluntarily. Yeah, voluntarily. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it, certainly, it's a mix of. It's a mix of genetics, you know, I'm a, I'm a fourth generation addict, uh, you know, of some type yep. and, you know, I have two kids, one of them has struggled, one hasn't, I mean, it's such a clear, it's such a clear path, it's a, it is a, the proverbial loaded gun, if you have it in your genetics and you choose to pick it up, you got a pretty solid shot of, of suffering some bad consequences. Yeah, no, it's very true. Okay, so, all right, so you, you run long distances, but now you run really long distances. I mean, 35, 50, hundreds of miles. Uh, how does that help you? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is it supposed to? Uh, yes. I hope you know, it helps. No, you. it does, it does. <laughs> it, it is a, 
um, it is a vehicle of self-exploration for me, and I, and I certainly got the question. Early on in those first three years, I actually ran, you know, I ran, when I ran every day, I actually ran 30 marathons in that period of time, like my first 30, and I, and I absolutely was, to a degree, addicted to running, and I, I had people ask. Not necessarily in a kind way, you know, haven't you just switched addictions? And I understood their point. But uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, addiction is about um, hiding, about being invisible, uh, about not having any feelings. And if you, if you do have one, heaven forbid, you know, you tamp it down with some, some drugs or a drink. And running is, is by its nature the exact opposite. It's like there is no hiding in running. It's you feel everything both physically and emotionally, or at least I do, w when I'm doing this, after I do it, and for the first time in my life I was fully present, you know, not only during the run, but during other times. Like if I go have a run in the morning, which I do most mornings, like it, it does set the stage for me to be energetic, and a happy mood, like, like that's done, and I feel good the rest of the day. So, again, people assume you run for fitness, meaning physical fitness, and that is, all, that is such a small component of the reason I run. Well, I'm glad you say that. Yeah. Um, I think that's, a lot of people miss that point. Um, many addicts tell me that they use a drug or alcohol to quiet the noise in mm. their brain. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, does running quiet your brain? Yes, in a way. I will say that it, it maybe is like this. There's a, you know, a roulette wheel normally has like one ball and a lot of slots. You know, I feel like sometimes I have like a ball for every slot and when you spin it, they're all bouncing around. <laughs> and if I go out for a run, like they do all sort of settle into their spot. They eventually roll around and find their spot and you know, and things sort of click. I, I learned a long time ago, I do take an audio recorder or these days my phone when I run because I do have good ideas or at least what I think are good ideas when I run. So there is, there is clarity there I think that uh, I find it harder to have sitting in an office or um, you know, trying to sort things out on a computer where you're, you, you got emails and, you know, phone calls and texts coming in all the time. And I, I, like, I can't keep one thought in my head for more than 30 seconds because there's 20 more that want to shove in. So running does help me solve that. And I, and I want to, I want to say just one quick thing. Addiction is, um, when I ran those first three years, I thought that what I needed to do was like take a scalpel and like eliminate the addict. Like if I could just cut that part of me out, that, you know, then I'd be okay. And it, it took that time to figure out that my, my addictive nature and my addictive qualities are actually all the best oh, yeah. parts of me, as you sort of pointed out a moment. Without those, I probably would just be sitting on the sofa, like playing video games or, you know, it makes me do things and it makes me pretty good at a few things. No, you're right. Uh, you know, the ability to you know hone in and concentrate on something is i mean you guys have you know rare gifts yeah. in that way as long as you know. positive and negative my wife says you know use your use your powers for good so so you know we've we've got an addiction crisis again in this country as if it ever went away so how do you help somebody you know kick this problem any any tricks? Man, it's a, that's a tough one. And I mean, it, it has changed. You actually just referenced, you know, in, in my day, I'm old enough that it felt like addiction was a long-term, you know, person might start drinking. They might start with smoking weed. They might start whatever. And it's this progression. What we're seeing with young people these days is they are zero to a hundred in a minute. Yeah. Like they are going from never doing anything to doing heroin and fentanyl like tomorrow and it's killing them. And yep. so two things that I would absolutely love to put out to your amazing audience is, you know, kind of the, the idea that we see at airports all the time, if you see something, say something, you know, very often it's self apparent. Like we really do see these things, but dealing with that with anybody in our life is a, it's a pain. You know, it causes emotional pain and it's hassle. It throws us out of our routine, right? 
and it's hard to do. Yeah. And that person very often is likely to say, you know, <laughs> screw you, I don't want to talk to you about this. You know, I don't have a problem. But you know, you have to take a stand with people. And for the people who, who might be the addict out there that are watching, you have to finally ask for help. Everybody thinks they can do it alone. I, I assure you, I'm confident in saying that I am one of the stronger mental people that you might ever meet as far as like just de determination. I could not do it alone. I tried over and over and it wasn't until I looked for you know, fellowship and support and, and had somebody to actually help me. You know, we spend 99% of our lives like preparing, all of us, for that 1% when everything goes wrong. And if you don't have a support network, whether it's addiction, disease, whatever it might be, you, you're, you're in trouble. So find that support system. So, you know, you've had crazy, you know, the crazy things. In 2007, Matt Damon produced, uh, what, Running the Sahara, a documentary. Your team ran across the Sahara Desert. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Why did you want to do that? No, mean, what inspired you? Come on. And, and, I, and I will fr I freely admit, after the fact, it almost looks like I had a great plan and I had some big... I wanted to see if it was possible. I mean, there are firsts in the adventure world, firsts in almost any field, are really hard to come by. And for me, uh, having the opportunity to try something that had never been done before and see what, if it was possible was very alluring. Um, and you know, and it fulfilled that need for me, you know, and, I, and I, again, I freely admit that there is a part of me, and maybe it's my addict, maybe, I don't know what, curiosity, that I try to approach every situation with a, you know, a curious mind and an open heart and the acceptance of the fact that I'm going to get something out of it. May not be what I want <laughs> or necessarily even need, but I try to look at the philosophy this way too. Comfort is like, ridiculously overrated. Like, I, I don't know, it was like somewhere in the 50s we invented the you know, electric can opener because we were just like all of a sudden too lazy to open our own cans anymore. And it's like all innovation has been towards like making life easier. Well, what have we ever gotten from that? Like, there's Nothing. no lesson in easy. Well, so you explain this to me. Uh, you slapped on a pair of tennis shoes and stepped out on the Sahara Desert and said, let's go, gang. <laughs> this sounds like an incredible organizational feat. Mm. Uh, just describe some of that. I mean, how do you do this? <laughs> well, what's funny about that is uh, you probably, if you, if you predicted what happened in that first week, you probably could. It was a dive into the abyss where absolutely everything imaginable went wrong. Like the, the 50 things that we thought maybe could go wrong, you know, just weather and whatever else, you know, those things went wrong too. But like we ran out of food, we ran out of water, we got lost. I had two crew people quit. It was 140 degree ground temperatures. So like you can practice and train and prepare at home when it's 80 degrees and you know, whatever, and you can go take a shower at the end of the day, but then when you get out there, it's a different world. This makes bad water look like a walk in the <laughs> park. I did bad water a bunch of times, and, and in a way, bad water is a compressed suffering, <laughs> as I like to say, uh, where you, you do know, at least with bad water, it's going to end. Like, somehow, it's, it's in a certain period of time, it's going to be over, and with, you know, with the Sahara Desert, it kind of just went on and on, but you know, we fell apart, quite frankly. And back to the lessons of addiction, what I realized that about a week into it was, I was, I was so intent on putting my feet in the Red Sea at the end of the expedition that I forgot that it, it really is like everything else, this, this one day at a time adventure. And so like on day eight, I focused on a mar running a marathon in the morning and get to lunch. And then I'd run another marathon in the afternoon, and that would be my whole sole focus, and get to the end of the day and lay on my mat and look at a billion stars and, and like give, you know, give thanks for the fact that I was actually able to be out there suffering and, and experiencing sort of a, a, I guess, a very life-changing experience for me.
And your shoes are melting? Yeah, shoe, well, bad water, that happens for sure. Yeah. The, the, in Death Valley, we had some funny, um, there, everything wants to stick you and poke you in the, in the desert because it's, it's trying to protect itself. And so we had a, put it this way, I had a, I had a unnamed, uh, in this moment, uh, shoe sponsor who had <laughs> air pockets in their shoes. And those things, like I'd be running along and it'd be like, <laughs> like that's higher. So it was, it was a, it was a really amazing experience. And the, the Tuaregs and the people of the desert were like so many impoverished places where they would offer you absolutely everything they had. And, I, and I'll tell you, anybody who's never, if you've driven into a, a village in a, an impoverished country, you're treated one way because you're driving in a car. They can't relate to that really, mm -hmm. you're, you're above them. You run into that same village and like nobody wants anything from you. They, they run along with you and laugh and have a great time and wave at you as you pass through having no idea why you're there. And it's a... Let's it's a, go watch the idiot. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Hey, there's some guys coming through your village. <laughs> but yes, no, it's, and it's true. They just, kids just yeah, run well, and have sure. fun. And that's, that's, all, that's what they know. It, it, language barriers aside, it was nothing but just human interaction. And that is why I'm out there. You know, I don't, I'm not, certainly not running across the desert to help myself physically. And I did, I, I pounded myself physically. I mean, it was two marathons a day, basically for 111 consecutive days. So tell me, what kind of physical toll did that take on you? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, stay tuned. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So I was, let's see, I'm 56 now, so I was basically 46 at the time. Okay of the run and I think the other thing that happens is that people assume like if you saw me run you, you would kind of go huh that's not particularly attractive you know I am a an incredibly efficient um, shuffler you know I mean it, it's the other misconception with running is when I when I enter a hundred mile race it doesn't matter how fast I run the first 50 miles why why would I go fast you know, my goal is to get from here to the end as fast as I can, which means a really measured approach where hydration and nutrition actually play a much bigger role than, than physical fitness. And then mental fitness, whatever that means. <laughs> I'm not sure how fit you have to be and mentally to run 100 miles, but um, I always like to say that uh, it's 90% mental and the rest is all in your head. Uh, very good, <laughs> I love it. So, you know, you are a master of endurance in these situations. Can you give people an example of, you know, how do you endure in difficult situations? You know, I think the endurance is a, is a state of mind as much as it is an act of the body. And so very often people want, we all want our results right away, right? And so, our experience though does tell us that it takes time to get where we want to go and the journey is in fact worth it. So if it's a physical journey, it, it is a matter of some moderation until, you, until your body adapts, until you're comfortable. A good example would be if you've ever, have you ever been to altitude, to high oh, altitude? Yeah. Yep. So how do you feel when you first get there? You know, it feels Lousy. terrible, right? So if you give yourself that time and, and you don't even have to do anything, you just have to breathe and sleep and hydrate and do all of these things, you know, your body will do its job all on its own if you let it. So I think the, the thing about endurance is really just a matter of being patient with, with endurance, both physically and, and mentally and setting yourself up for success by understanding it's a, it's a long-term commitment, not, not a sprint. Okay, so your book, Running Man, uh, described, this is a memoir, right? I Indeed. Mean, this is, okay. I tell it all. Uh, tell me, in 2010, you were convicted of mortgage fraud. Indeed. And uh, you, the conviction, you say, is unjust, um, which is fine. And you went on to serve 16 months in prison. I did. How did that come about? Yeah, well, interestingly, <clears throat> it is in some ways a direct result of the notoriety that came from running the Sahara. Um, 
you know, the other piece of the puzzle that we didn't discuss, and I'm still very proud of, is that, you know, Matt and I created a nonprofit called H2O Africa, which today is called water.org. So out of running the Sahara is the world's largest clean water nonprofit, and we passed, you know, a billion dollars in funding recently. And wow. so out of a crazy idea with no expectations, you know, good things can blossom. Bad things can also blossom. You know, I lived in small town North Carolina, attracted the attention of one particular IRS agent who saw uh, the film and decided that he wasn't interested in uh, what I did, but rather in, in his opinion, how I did it. And without all the minutia, it's in the book. And I never came out and defended because in today's society, you know, defending yourself is the surest way to be skewered. <laughs> and so I actually just kept my mouth shut and let other people, um, the New York Times, uh, a lot of other journalists and professionals examine the situation and basically come, make their own choice to come out in defense. Long story short, I was the only person in the United States at that time to actually be charged with overstating my income on a home loan application from 2005. I've heard of that recently happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's, right. <clears throat> there are, it has progressed as we've gone forward, you know, to other people, but at the time, I was essentially the only person being charged with this. And I fought it because I didn't do it. And I was actually found not guilty of doing it, interestingly, but guilty of, uh, other, other things like mail fraud, because I took a, a closing package and put it in the mail, even though it had information in there, <coughs> excuse me, that, um, that you're getting, I didn't put You're getting there, choked whatever. up over this, I, know, I can exactly. tell. <laughs> I've been talking a lot, but you know, the idea that, um, the idea that this happened to me was incredibly um, unfair, yet, the addict part of me, to bring it all the way back around, you know, part of me believed that I was getting something I deserved, you know? I mean, that psychologically, I understand the way my own brain works pretty well, at least in hindsight. And, I, you know, once I was, you know, I was scared. I mean, I went to trial, I fought it, I got sentenced to 21 months, 16 of it that I did actually in prison and two and a half way house. Uh, and it, needless to say, it changed everything, you know, and overnight I was, there were no more speaking gigs or, uh, you know, sponsors or anything else. It was everything. I was kind of purged from my own life in a single day. So you could have taken this opportunity to feel really victimized and maybe head right back down into the gutter. Totally. But you took this uh, to inspire you and to inspire others. So what happened? Uh, you know, I had spent years doing motivational type speaking and telling other people that, uh, you know, what happens to us isn't nearly as important as what we do about it. Things happen to everybody, good and bad, and your response to that is what matters. Well, that's easy to say when most of the things are in this little middle ground, you know? I maybe had more highs and lows than most people, but I finally, uh, through no choice of my own, had the opportunity, let's say, to, to, uh, you know, to act in the way that I had been speaking for years. And, you know, the day I literally reported, my, my teenage boys dropped me off in front of uh, federal prison, you know, on Valentine's Day 2011, and I kissed them goodbye and walked through that gate, uh, and I was scared and I was angry, you know, I was angry about what had been done to me, yeah, right? Yeah. And it took about a day <laughs> for me to figure out that uh, I wasn't going to make it if I was going to be bitter and angry, and it, this this situation was untenable under those circumstances. And so who I was going to be in, in there behind bars was totally up to me. And it was still my decision whether or not I was gonna do it in a way that was impactful not only for me, but for other people. And I did what I always do, I ran. I, I, I went there and I, the first chance I got, I started running around the rec yard and if we were in lockdown, I would run for six hours at a time in my cell, in place. Whoa. 
And I mean, I looked more than a little crazy, I'm sure, but um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. And you know, in prison, prison, it can be yeah. helpful. But um, and people did sort of like steer a wide <laughs> path. But slowly, I mean, you, I, I think actually I'm, I'm getting ready to like step right into your, you know, incredible wheelhouse, which is so much of life is attraction rather than promotion. You know, you can, you can talk about things all you want, but people are more attracted to action. They, they, if they see results in you, then they want to come do what you do. True. And if yeah. you switch that over and if I switch that over and spend too much time telling other people what they should do, like, uh, you know, whatever, then for me it gets a little tricky. But what happened in there is guys started coming up to me saying, hey, you know, can, I, can you teach me how to run? And when I got there, there were probably three or four guys running regularly. And when I, when I left, I had, a, I had a running group of 50 guys and I had 25 of them doing yoga with me like three days a week out on the softball field. And 11 guys lost more than 100 pounds. And you know, most of these men had never had any, anybody ever pay any attention to them in a positive way, you know, physically and emotionally. And so it, you know, when I left, they thanked me. They're like, oh, you know, we're, we're so grateful. I'm like, could you just stay a couple more ah, years? Yeah, right. I was like, I got to go. But, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. But the, the uh, no, it's, I say the same thing. And the, and the thing is, what they didn't understand at the time is what they did for me. I mean, they, that experience actually got me through it. It wasn't the other way around. You know, it gave me purpose because we need that, you know, I believe. And it gave me energy and, and power and humility. And a side note is, you know, I'm in there with, you know, I can feel sorry for myself for getting this 21 month sentence and I'm in there next to, you know, a guy in the cell next to me who got, you know, 25 years for some tiny amount of, you know, crack cocaine or something and like had his whole life taken away. So it's, it's perspective very often and, and it gave me a perspective that I'm a pretty freaking lucky guy. So you weren't in a white collar crime no. country club. No, this was a prison. This was, you know, this was a prison and, you know, it, was it Sartre, I think, who said, you know, prison is uh, other people. Oh no, hell is other people. <laughs> well, like that's, you know, the hardest part is being away from family and of course being surrounded by people 24 hours a day that you actually can't get away from. So finding a way through meditation, through, you know, I did my best to eat healthy as I could uh, with really unhealthy choices, but you know, those things are still a big part of my life. Yeah. So, okay, so now you're out, you're, you're a convicted yes. felon. <laughs> so what happens after that? I mean, that was just a few years ago. Yeah, and it, and it is the, once again, I feel incredibly lucky to be who I am because most people get out of prison and they, they they can never get a job, you know, and, and they've got this F for felon, you know, practically tattooed on them and they end up on, you know, the public dole for the rest of the, I mean, it's a, it's a terrible fiscal decision for society too, because it, it's, it punishes everybody. It punishes all of society not to give people better ways to reintegrate. But for me, I basically just did again what I always did. I, I started running and I took my energy and organized uh, something called the Icebreaker Run, which was me and five other recovering drug addicts ran uh, across the United States. We ran a relay 24 hours a day for 24 consecutive days to the like NAMI mental health con uh, convention in Washington D.C. and uh, and it was to you know raise awareness for the need for greater mental health services in this country. You know, because so much of what we all experience in the news and personally daily and certainly out here in beautiful Southern California where you've got a, a ridiculously difficult homeless uh, issue, um, it's so much of it is wrapped around mental health. So yeah. I just, yep. you know what, Doc, I just kept doing the things that I do and, and kept moving forward because continuous forward movement pretty much will always win out. Over, over the uh, rolling up in a fetal position uh, option, so. Good for you. So, okay, so you've done all this wonderful stuff and now you're not satisfied. <laughs> you're gonna do a 4,500 mile trek 
from the shore of the Dead Sea to the peak of Mount Everest? You're not just going to go to base camp? That would be, why, you know, it's like, it's pretty at base camp, but I hear it's prettier on top, so. So when and why, when and why are you doing this? Yeah, so the idea actually came about, you know, 10 years ago, the way so many things do, they take a long time to work out, but I, uh, metaphorically speaking, I'd had a lot of high, lows and highs in my life, and it literally just popped into my head. Why don't I go from the lowest place on the planet to the highest and carry a little flask of water from the Dead Sea and, and pour it out on the top of Everest and uh, join these two ends of the earth in a, in a symbolic gesture. So symbolism is great, but then there's hard work. Yeah. So uh, I'm very happy to say that um, I have even just recently uh, put together an amazing film team, a, a group of sponsors and partners that, are, that we're announcing soon. Uh, and I'm actually not just doing Dead Sea to Everest. What I'm actually doing is going from the lowest place on each continent to the highest point on that continent. And the first one's only, <clears throat> only a couple of months from now, uh, Africa. So I'm going from the lowest place in Africa, which is a lake over in Djibouti, across Ethiopia, through the Rift Valley, into Kenya, with the Maasai Mara region, to Tanzania, and up Kilimanjaro to the top. Ah. So, yeah, and I'm doing it with a buddy of mine, Andre, who, I always lead with this, you know, Andre is noticeable um, for a lot of reasons, but Andre has no legs. So um, he won the Hawaii Ironman World Championship Disabled Division a few years ago, yeah. and he's hand cycled across the U.S. And, you know, it's, as you can tell, I'm, I like telling stories, and the mechanism for me to do that is to go out and do things and hopefully have an opportunity to, you know, hopefully gently tug some people along with us, uh, either online or even a few in person, and uh, just remind people that, you know, yes, there, balance is needed in some ways in life, but you, you, you can't find balance on the sofa. You need to get out and do something. So, uh, you know, you've talked about the mental aspect of, of running. Mm -hmm. So what kind, of, what kind of tricks can you give people to get them through taking on a new activity or taking on an unpleasant task to get where they want to go? So <laughs> I, have one, I have one trick for sure because people do this to me all the time. They come up and they say, gosh, you know, I really want to be, I really want to run, but I hate running. <laughs> so my, my answer first and foremost to them is, look, you know, if you go into your job every day and you say, I hate this job, or you go home every day and you're like, I hate this relationship, Guess what? <laughs> you know, you really are putting yourself in a place where you can't win. So, a certain amount of self-deception can be healthy. You know, so if you're going to try any kind of exercise program, any kind of new nutrition program, you, you, in my view, you can't start it from the premise of, I hate this. You know, that kind of self-talk really makes it difficult. So, find a way around that by you don't have to say you love it, but maybe at least don't say out loud that you hate it. I think that's, a, it's not even just a trick, it's just a, a basic uh, idea of in, ingraining yourself with a positive uh, outlook towards this new challenge. You referenced earlier that that first step is not even, uh, you know, the first step is really out the door. And I think the biggest mistake people make is I, I, am, a, I am an instinctive trainer, I'm an instinctive runner. So. If you ask me how many miles I'm running tomorrow, I have no idea. I don't know how I'm going to feel tomorrow. And I think people become a slave to schedule and without listening to their body and sort of taking in the information that they've got in any given moment. So I think finding a way to be more intuitive about it, hopefully that intuition doesn't say stay on the sofa, <laughs> but um, you know, to be intuitive and to actually, you know, to, to actually just budget your time, because most people, their, their biggest problem, they say, is time, right? Right. So if I tell them to go run five miles, <clears throat> it seems daunting. They're staring at their watch constantly. If I say, budget 30 minutes, can you budget 30 minutes? They're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, all you're going to do, you're just going to go walk. You're going to walk, you're going to start walking. If you feel good, you might jog for five minutes, then walk some more, and 15 minutes into it, you turn around and you go back. And if you can just get yourself to do that a few days a week, I mean, 
just like with nutrition, you, you've got to make the commitment to try it. And if you give it one week and quit because you haven't seen the results, then you were wasting your time to begin with. Right. You yeah. know, if you're only going to give it that short time or, you know, whatever, then you, you, you weren't serious about getting the results, in my opinion. Yeah, I've said this before, but I actually write people prescriptions to get a dog. <laughs> I, I literally I on that. a prescription Can you write me pad. One? Eh? Yeah, that would be fantastic. Be we really need a dog. And, and so. they actually uh, mm. bring it back framed and say this is the best fantastic. prescription a doctor has ever done you know, for me. Because a dog you know, forces you oh out, my gosh. out the door. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and to me, seeing the joy, we have three dogs, we usually have four, but seeing the joy that a dog yeah. gets, you know, yeah. outdoors. Yeah. And it's just, you know, you get, you forget the shin splints and you forget. You do. And you, you really do. Well, yeah. and that joyful feeling is what people can get if they, if they do it the right way. And you sharing it with other people, finding, finding yeah. a buddy to do some running with is a much easier way to do it also. <clears throat> All right. So as you know, I think nutrition is way up on the pyramid of important things for your health. Tell me about nutrition and what you do. Where is it in the scheme of things? Yeah, good question. Um, so I grew up in the South. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, preempt it with that. And uh, very meat-centric uh, kind of an upbringing. And about 20 years ago, I, deci I did decide to make a change. And uh, I went to a vegetarian diet. Today, of course, we... Uh, I don't use the word vegan, but just because it's, it brings up so many weird connotations today, but plant-based plant is what you would absolutely yeah. call me. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I am fully plant-based and have been for a really long time at this point. And um, it has worked really well for me, you know, for the, for the challenges that I have. That said, here I am sitting, I mean, what, one of the things that I pride myself on is this idea that... I always have more to learn. And I, I think one of the big mistakes people make, whether it's physical activity or nutrition or anything else, is they, they think they've got it licked and they close their minds to you know, new ideas. And uh, I am, I'm very interested to read your book and to find out a little more about... Uh, uh, well, I, I am very much plant-based, but I try to tell people there are certain plants that like you and yeah. certain plants that don't like you. Yeah. And anytime anybody worries about getting protein, mm -hmm. uh, I just remind them that a gorilla and a horse are plant-based animals and they have more muscles than we will ever have, even you. Totally. Yeah. No, I, I could not agree more, actually. And, and I, I'm, I'm really intrigued about uh, uh, some of the things that I've read uh, that, that you promote and that your studies have shown. And, It'll be a fascinating journey for me, so stay tuned. All right, great. Keep us in mind one on the way up. Yeah. Okay, before we go, you know uh, I am a huge proponent of exercise, and I write about it, but I do believe there is too much of a good thing. And off camera, I mentioned to you that Mark Sisson of Mark's Daily Apple and the Primal Blueprint, who was in his prime a great marathoner mm -hmm. and a great ultra marathoner. Sure now at least tells me, and I think he said this publicly, that the farthest a human being should run is 100 yards uh, because of the toll long-term uh, long cardio uh, has, in my view, on the heart. Uh, what say you? Well, what if the police are chasing you, Dr. Gundry? I mean, then can you run more than 100 miles? I'm sorry. Well, yeah, believe it or not, I think, I think we actually were designed to run about 100 yards to get away from a wild boar. <laughs> well, for hunting. I mean, I, with all due respect to Mark, I mean, I, you know, the, the one thing that, takes, that doesn't take into account is, in my view, what Mark should be saying is that Mark should not run more than 100 yards at a time. Because it's none of his business how much I run. You know, and, it's, and it really is um, the mistake that I think a lot of experts make is putting a massive blanket over everyone and that blanket statement covers everybody. I mean, we are, you know, we are soup, as I like to say, you know, with all these different genetic inputs and, and then, of course, environmental uh, situations, too. And for me to not uh, run 
would be, I, I could find another way. Look, I'm a cyclist, I do hot yoga, I do, like, I like doing all kinds of physical activities. Um, you know, I mean, to not run, I mean, for, for someone to say blanket that nobody should run more than 100 yards, I, I think is, is trying a little too hard to make a provocative statement that he can get a response. I don't, I don't, you know. All right, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you a softball right over oh, the good. plate Thank for goodness. you. I'm left-handed. Yes. Oh, okay, all okay. right. So what do you say to all the people, look at the people who are dying during oh. runs? Yeah, I, I got the question two weeks ago. Guy said three marathoners died at the Chicago Marathon. I mean, is running dangerous? I said, yes, it is. I said, but, you know. There were 5,673 people that died on their sofa last weekend. For God's sake, do not sit on your sofa. Because to me, that is a place that clearly kills people. So you Sitting know, kills. That's no doubt. Well, and, you, and <laughs> you know, look, I, am, I don't claim that running, pe people look for absolutes. To say that running is absolutely healthy for everyone, that would also be an idiotic statement. <clears throat> you have to find what that thing is for you and do it, you know, whatever it is, physical activity, walking, yoga, something, just get out there and, and get it done. And yeah. hydration is the other thing, which apparently I'm not well hydrated today, <laughs> but I, I, I think that that's the other big thing that people miss is that they forget the one key ingredient that we're all made of and, and, uh, and maybe don't drink quite enough. So going to all these exotic locations and spending huge amounts of time with this, it, does it, you ever feel like it's taking you away from more important things? Yes. You know, and, my, and I write freely about it in my book in the sense that my, my kids, it's really not a running book, it's a, it's a life book. You know, my kids who are both in their 20s, two boys, uh, we're very honest in our family, and they sat down with me, you know, a while back in some uh, just family time and said, you know, we, we like who you are, we're proud of you for what you've done, but we actually wish you'd been around more when we were kids. And, and I do say to them that I understand and, and that they are, they're right, but there's also the, I think some parents forget that giving your entire life over to your children, all of it, and, and having your singular focus be raising those kids is not a sustainable, I mean, I guess it is maybe the definition of sustainable, but who wants just sustainable? You know, my kids now are, you know, traveling in China and they're going and they, they are, they'll get on a bus or a plane or something and they'll spend their money on experiences and not on things. And so hopefully it's been a balance. All right, because my new book, The Longevity Paradox is out and on the New York mm -hmm. Times bestseller list, and thank you everybody, uh, ask everybody on the program, what's one thing that our listeners can do for a healthier, longer mm -hmm. life? And I think we've kind of talked about that, but yeah. one thing. Hydration. I know I just said it a moment ago, but I'm actually gonna, I'm actually gonna hammer that. And, and if I wanna make an addendum, sleep. I was one of those people who thought I was special for a long time and I, I only need four or five hours of sleep and you know and I'm, I'm just I function at a higher level than other people right right and when I made a commitment about five years ago is how long it took to to make sure I got my eight hours of sleep every night uh, it changed everything it allowed for good nutrition you know you can take all the great supplements and you can do all of that you want. And if you get in lousy sleep and you're not hydrated, it doesn't give your body to, a chance to even use that. So, right? You're absolutely you're right. No, you're absolutely <laughs> right. We had Ariana Huffington a few months ago on, you know, who, I saw that one. who really thought she could get away with four and five hours yeah. and, until she broke her face on a desk, you yeah. know, just... High succeeding people have a very high opinion of themselves. And I mean, I, I, I don't need that. Right, I don't need that. That's for, that's for lesser people or people who need sleep. And we all need it. And we will function better during our awake day times, you know, hours when, uh, when we get good sleep. So thanks for asking. All right, that. yeah, that's a yeah. great advice. All right, Charlie, it's been great to have you on the podcast today. Um, how do people find you? How do they support your track? 
Thank you for that. Yeah, just I'm super simple. CharlieEngel.com. All my social media is just my name, Charlie Engel, and this latest project, uh, which links to everything else, is just 5.8project.com. 5.8project.com. Yeah. So on that note, that's it for the Dr. Gundry podcast this week. Thanks for joining us. See you on Everest. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.